Welcome everybody to today's Fireside Chat. I'm James Rickett, Global Lead for Anti-Money Laundering and Sanctions Compliance at the International Compliance Association. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Pia Vokes, Vice President of UK, Ireland, Middle East, I've got the right, Silent and Eight. Africa. <laughs> and Africa, of course. Uh, at Silent Eight, so it's brilliant. We're getting here together today for a, a Fireside Chat about everything, data, AI, technology, uh, in the world of anti-money laundering and financial crime. Pia, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me, James. No, it's good. So, we've got a lot to talk about. We were having a bit of a chat before this, weren't we, about some of the ideas and we got a bit carried away. Uh, so we need to try and refine all of that in. So, I'll kick off really. Um, data, anti-money laundering, why is it important? I think really, Data underpins everything, mm -hmm. everything that we do day to day, but I think especially in AML, without good data, you've got an inefficient process straight away. Yeah. But the problem is, is that the data goes back so far and sort of data enrichment and good data quality has only just started to come into play and there's a mm -hmm. lot more work to be done, to be quite honest. Yeah. And I think because we're still using so much historical data that is of bad quality, there's still gonna be problems moving forward. But I do think that having technology to supplement some of that bad data is very, very beneficial. Um, I think that you can definitely see already, even if you just look at um, setting up a bank account now, it's pretty much impossible to put in wrong bank details because automatically your bank account is saying, we don't recognize that. Yeah. So you can see that data quality issues are being combated by technology already. Yeah, well, we're gonna talk about data because I think in uh, certainly a place like the UK, the US, where it's so heavily regulated, there is a requirement for all these data. But we, we see in the media, of course, it's not working, things like beneficial ownership registries, which we'll come on and talk about. So let's let's talk about the evolution of data then. So you, you I totally agree, data combating financial crime, it is one source of information for an organisation. Uh, I think where we maybe misunderstand data combating financial crime is that it can lead to um, good credit decisions, liquidity and things. But we, we're going to focus on anti-money loan because that's what we're passionate and we care about. So let's take our mind back, say, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We were probably a little bit too young to be. I wasn't we're, even in the field. Yeah, James. neither was I, <laughs> just so we're clear. Um, but let's talk about CDD. 20 years ago, uh, technology wasn't a thing. It's likely that all of this paper was scattered over desks, KYC forms. How are firms managing AML risk then, do you think? It's an extremely manual process. Mm. I can't imagine how long it must have taken to open a bank account with the amount of paperwork they would have had to have gone through. Mm. And it just baffles me that someone is able to look at somebody's passport and sign off on it yeah. without really checking any of the data points that come yeah. along with that. And that's a huge responsibility. Yeah, well, I've got a view on this, and we're going to come back to this. And I know we, we talked about this a little bit earlier on. Uh, but the, I guess the question is, was AML, was AML as much of a concern 15, 20 years ago for not just tier one financial institutions, but the regulated sector? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I wasn't in the industry then, so yeah. it's probably hard for me to give you know a concrete answer. Mm. But I my opinion of it would be that probably not, because of the fact that, there just wasn't the process yeah. in place, let alone the process then to regulate it yeah. and to manage it and to look at eliminating the risk that the process yeah. can carry if the process isn't there in the first place. Yeah, well, it cost a lot of money. So management of any financial crime risk was loads of money. And um, I saw a, a LinkedIn exchange the other day about how AML teams were perceived as the cost killers, the business prevention unit. I see AML evolution like this. So um, this is a really silly analogy, but but stick with it. Do you know when, or maybe maybe this is an insight into my life, but Here maybe do you know when you get invited to your friend's house, but it's a really last minute invite. Yeah. And instead of joining the nice big table where all the rest of your mates are, you sat on like a little table at the side. <laughs> so people can say that you were there, but you can't you, you can't really do anything. Nobody You're really at the cares. Kids table at Christmas. Well, I do. Yeah. So maybe maybe <laughs> that's an insight into my life. But um, it's evolved, and that's obviously been partial partially driven because of the regulatory scope increasing, number of fines increasing, and we've got to a point now where money laundering reporting officers compliance as a function is really important. So we've got this uh, archaic paper based management of risk impossible to manage. And I remember walking into some 
uh, places where data used to be stored not that long ago, paper everywhere and you can't manage the risk. And it's evolved and firms have become smarter about utilizing the data. So let's let's talk about um, the evolution with CDD. You've already mentioned it. So you mentioned a really interesting point about a passport. Can you can just elaborate to the viewers what we mean when we say how do we trust what we're looking at? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, to everyday people maybe that aren't in the AML compliance world, mm -hmm. your passport is just a way of verifying your identity, but they don't really consider how many data points are really in that piece of yeah. paper, you know, that laminated document. Yeah. Um, and I think to verify someone's identity is a much bigger task than people really realize. To say that you are 100% sure that that person's passport is theirs yeah. and that it's a genuine passport is a huge task because what are you basing that on? But isn't the risk with everything? So how how can we say for 100% that anything is what it is? Can we do that? So, I don't think you can ever say 100% yeah. because you can't get rid of risk ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're always just trying to mitigate it. But I think that by using technology, you're able to draw in a lot more of those data points and verify them individually and understand, okay, this all suggests that this passport is real, this passport does belong to yeah. this person. So let's let's lean on this point because I think we're, co we're coming on to a really valuable and important point around technology here. Um, if we, let's, let's go, I'm gonna use the pandemic as an accelerant because it was a, an accelerant for a lot of the world. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about what happened to firms and the vulnerabilities that were faced. So pre-pandemic, uh, major institutions, what was the mechanism? How did they verify who, who somebody was? So I walk into your firm here and I say, I'd like a, an account or a, I want to, a relationship with whatever product or service you're offering. How are you going to verify me? Sure. So, you know, typically you're looking for a passport, you're asking yeah. for a driver's license, utility bill, maybe even a... a pay slip if you've got that as yeah. well cool so uh, i know you need all this information i walk into your firm i've got a passport i've got my driving license i've got a bank statement and i've probably got a utility bill to prove where i live what are you going to do with that passport now i've given it to you well now you've got to ask you know is this person who they say they are by looking at their passport yeah. and typically all people were doing is looking at the picture and going yeah, that looks like James. Yeah. <laughs> Much like a bouncer trying to get into a club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so you've looked at the picture. You, you're comfortable it's me. Are you, are you doing anything else? You've got the passport in your hand. Are you, yeah. And then have you got any other tests that you're going to do? I think back then they were just signing off, right? Just saying that that is who they say mm. they are and guaranteeing that. Well, we say back then, firms are still doing it, right? Signing yeah, it off and we'll, we'll talk about that. So no other tests. You've got it in your hand. You're not like... I don't know, biting it? I don't know, what do you do? do people smell it? Does it smell yeah, like Yeah, I mean, I know that they were reading the MRZ code um, at the bottom, or MZ yeah. code, sorry, at the bottom. But again, that can't actually say that yeah. that passport is that person's passport. It can say that that jumble of letters and numbers that are in that order yeah. Has a v validity, yeah. but it can't say that that's James Ricketts' passport, for yeah. example. Cool. So I've now got an account because you've looked at my passport. You've signed it, Pete. It's your name, your signature's on there. Maybe a fancy stamp, or yeah. whatever. some people do that. Um, and in some instances, some firms will say, "Oh, you can go to a notary, so you can go to a doctor, and uh, or you can go to a solicitor or a bank manager as a as a somebody that's recognised." Um, now, I'm assuming you might have done due diligence before. Uh, you've got the passport in your hand. Are you a, a trained border force agent? Are you, do you know what one a passport looks Unfortunately, like? Unfortunately, not in another life. No, and I'm not either. <laughs> but um, as a control, it was kind of accepted in risk appetites that that would be an appropriate level of diligence. Cool. So the world, unfortunately, then hit, hit the pandemic. All of a sudden, we can't meet. I can't come and see you. You've said that you need these documents. Now, thinking about this risk from a, a firm's perspective, the, nobody was in a position to start declining business. No. How, how can you do that when all these economic stimulus measures are coming out? So now the pandemic hits, now I want to come into your firm and get a relationship. How are you going to verify me? Everything's gone online, hasn't it? So, But there was that little period of time where it happened so quick. There was that stumbling block where yeah. nobody really knew what to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that even today, you know, doing this online, there is, you know, risk with it. 
Yeah. But there is also challenges because not every part of the world is online, for example, but Good, not yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. within the UK is online. You know, mm. you'd be surprised at the amount of people that probably still don't have internet. Yeah. And also, you know, the older generation, for example, they're not picking up a, a FaceTime or a WhatsApp call and things like that with with a bank mm. because they don't necessarily know how to do that. Yeah. My so, grandma WhatsApps me, but she, it's all in one word. So there's no, <laughs> yeah, there's no, no spaces. Words. But let's talk about uh, what happened. So a lot of firms, as we've said, weren't ready um, to adapt to this. Now, I'm not just talking banks. I'm talking real estate, high value dealers, uh, solicitors. Uh, so all of a sudden then we're in a situation people needed to do business needed to, to create these relationships and they couldn't so what I don't know what your experience with this I saw a lot of firms that were um, th they would uh, say right send me a picture of your passport um, can we go on zoom um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll open the account now you've got three months once we can meet each other again so all of a sudden, these major controls for ID, and we're going to evolve this into transaction monitoring as well, all these major firms, all of a sudden, it was a problem, now it's not so much of a problem. I'm a money launderer. Well, I'm not a money launderer, but <laughs> if I was a money launderer, um, I'm thinking, I can open an account here, yeah. I can get my dirty money in, and I can move it back out again. Well, this is the thing. They're looking for the weakest link, aren't yeah. they? So as much as we're looking at, okay, the world's evolved and we've all gone online and now we're seeing like there are so many benefits from it because yeah. you can open a bank account in, you know, minutes, you know. It, that to a money launderer is gold. Yeah. Because now everything's so much more accessible to them. Yeah. Well, it, type, it had to evolve and firms had to come up with a solution because it was clear that the world was not going to be the same. And to be honest, I don't think customers, which we are customers, we don't, we don't want to stand for that anymore. We want to move with the times. So let's talk about the evolution. Um, technology. How yeah. does techno, how did, te what role has technology played in allowing? So let's stay on the onboarding element of CDD. Um, how could I, how could we safely mitigate the risks then? Fire onboarding. So if I um, say I'm going to give you my passport again, how can a firm make sure that that passport is legitimate now? Is it safer than face to face? I don't know. I think that there are definitely benefits of using technology. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like I said, because there are a lot of data points within the passport itself, yeah. you're able to explore all of those avenues. So it's no longer about just relying on the photograph as um, evidence for that yeah. person being who they say they are. Now you can look at birth certificate records. Do they align with the birth date on the yeah. passport itself? Address, you know, you can look at geolocation, things like that. There are a lot of data enrichment pieces that can be done yeah. just off the back of using tech to look at the passport itself. Yeah. Now, what, um, what if I told you, and I'm sorry to interrupt, what if I told you I could buy a passport in 10 minutes with your card, not mine, uh, that would get me a passport that would get me through a border. I know. It was crazy when we were looking at it earlier and yeah. I can't believe how cheap it is as well. So I've given you my passport uh, and you're a little bit you're not sure because you think, well, I, you know, I know the vulnerability around this. Um, wh what other pieces of information would you ask for to help me prove who I was? Yeah, so now we're looking at the selfie. <laughs> oh, we love a selfie. <laughs> but but you are going to go through the steps, aren't we? We're going to maybe a driving licence. Yeah. Uh, you're going to want to know where I live, so possibly yeah, a so bank statement. Yeah, so we want utility bill, bank statement, yeah. anything that can prove your address, pay slip. But I think as we saw earlier, all of this can be really easily forged now. Yeah, and I'm not going to uh, say what websites they are, <laughs> but it did take us about five minutes to, to get a passport that could get us through a border, a driving licence registered to a government entity, a bank statement of our choice, uh, a utility bill from a utility provider of our choice. And we even found some selfie technology, didn't we? Where we could pick a picture uh, and we could adapt it into that selfie. So even then, uh, and I know lots of firms here that were saying, hold up your passport next to your face and yeah. take a selfie. What? But technology will allow you to have that picture and that passport now. So yeah. it's really a difficult situation yeah. to be able to navigate what's the best route. and. And like you said, is the technology helping us or is it mm. helping the money launderers? So thinking about controls then, um, we spoke about a few firms, didn't we? Some really good uh, technology providers out there. We, um, we we talked about, let's walk through digital onboarding. So we first of all looked at what we 
called an EKYC. I'm not sure if that is the terminology, but it's an electronic as opposed to that paper based. So we've already got the evolution. Um, we fill in a form electronically. Yeah. It screens the information we provide. So it will look at the various risk factors that we're aware of. So the products we need, our nationality, citizenship, tax residency, date of birth, all of these different data points. And the system starts to base its algorithm and calculation against our risk appetite that our firm sets. Then moves to the next part, doesn't it? Take a picture of our, of our ID. Now you alluded to this, Piers, so you said birth records, we said possibly death records, yep. but really any government-backed repository, right? So a council tax, possibly, yep. um, electoral role, um, credit reference agencies, and it generates a score. Then we talked about how we verify it's us. So maybe you just want to um, tell our viewers what we spoke about. When we've done that selfie, how are we mitigating the risks around that? Because we could easily take one using deep fake technology. Again, the technology is the theme. Um, what were the other things that we were talking about that were helping us mitigate the risk? Yeah, so I think over the years, people have obviously seen that pe the way people take selfies, mm. you can quite clearly see, you know, whether it's front camera, back camera, are the person's eyes slightly elevated? So are they reading off of a screen perhaps mm. um, or looking up because somebody's taking the picture of them? Is there maybe something in the background? And you brought up a great point of technology being able to even recognize potential bunk beds in the background, mm. which is so advanced. Yeah. But that's causing you know a flag to be raised because that's not normal behavior necessarily. Yeah. I should probably explain the bunk beds thing. <laughs> uh, it's because it's been recognized as a typology of, of uh, potential exploitation, whether that's sexual or human exploitation. Uh, but we spoke about as well the selfie that's taken against the ID. It can even detect um, markings on somebody's face. Now, it doesn't mean to say that there's anything suspicious, right? But what happens? So technology's played an important role here in, first of all, evading the misuse of technology. So the uh, image we talk about, but it's now generated the positive. So in assuming then it detects that there's an anomaly, what happens at this point? I think we te the technology we looked at, we were talking about, uh, it escalated it, didn't it? So it moved it on to a person. Yeah, so yeah, and, and this is key, is that as much as we talk about technology, there always does need to be, and what we, t we talk about in Silent Late is a human in the loop. We're not talking about technology replacing people. It's very much about this collaboration that you need to combine the best yeah. of technology with the best people. Um, because at the end of the day, people are hired because of their expertise they go through training you'll know all about that one James yeah of course <laughs> I have to yeah. Um, yeah and so there is a certain element where you do need that human set of eyes to say make, to make a decision so this is where now we can start to open up the conversation a little bit more into the transaction monitoring space because yeah. transaction monitoring is, is a critical part of a firm's ability to combat money laundering risk um, now, we we spoke about obviously the importance and the value of it. So maybe we can start to think about then the difference between AI and machine learning. Um, if I said to you, Pierre, you know, um, define machine learning or define AI, what are the sort of things you're going to say? Yeah, so AI is essentially where a computer can mimic human cognitive functions. Yeah. So there's not actually much learning going on in mm -hmm. the AI. It's basically coding to be able yeah. to replicate what a human does but obviously at yeah. greater speeds handle a lot more data whereas machine learning is a lot more about well it's an application of ai so it's like a subset um but it's using you know mathematical models um and data to be able to learn without direct instruction and you've got supervised and unsupervised and you know they carry risks and benefits of both um, but yeah, yeah, okay. it's the continuous learning loop is the important part of machine learning. So tying this into transaction monitoring then, with AI, what we're saying is we give it the rules and um, it will follow those rules. So if we've got regulatory requirements that say you have a threshold which you must monitor or you're in a jurisdiction that's got currency transaction reporting, um, we can the machine will tell it that's what you need to look for. We can tell it for red flags. So how can machine learning then be beneficial for transaction monitoring then? So the whole idea is that the machine learning part is 
learning from the outputs of the data. So it's looking at actually what are the analysts doing within that organization? Yeah. What's the commentary that, that they're providing? What's the data structure coming in of those payments and all of the data points within them and being able to identify actually over time, these are the suggestions that the, the machine learning can make. So yeah. it's about making those efficiency gains to be able to you know, help with the decision making process. It's yeah. not always about making the decision, yeah. but it's about making that process before it so much more efficient because in transaction monitoring, you're pulling in so much data yeah. Yeah. from mm -hmm. all different areas within that organization, external data sources. There's so much verification of data going on that you need to be able to do that quickly. Yeah. And that's the problem is that because so much of this is done retrospectively, being able to do a lot more of it in real time, that's where the machine learning element and the AI and interacting with technology can benefit all of that. So let's talk about this, because I think does, it, it sounds like to me with your expertise that machine learning, particularly around transaction monitoring, is going is should be the now and it's definitely the future. So let's build this into um, a specific risk. Okay. We had a conversation about terrorist financing, didn't we? We did. And we know it's abhorrent. Um, in fact, where we're sitting today, one of the most famous attacks in the United Kingdom was only a couple of hundred meters away. So to demonstrate the point around transaction monitoring and, and the value of technology, let's 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 have a little bit of um, fun. Let's build the bank account of a terrorist. Okay. So we and and people recognise this, and we'll use all the high risk indicators that we know about that will uh, help us how we detect it. So if we see it land on our desk, ah, we think this is terrorist financing. And then we'll evolve the conversation. So let's talk about incomings first. Um, you're looking at an account. You've seen some red flags for terrorist financing. What do they look like? I think typically you're looking at, you know, repetitive amounts of money. Yeah. Um, you're looking at where the transaction is going. Yeah. Where it's coming from. Is there any information in terms of, you know, words or you know phrases used within the the message yeah. itself um but i think you know well let's go in comments then so so you're right so so if i just reel them off if would i if i say to you uh, do you think that looks like terrorist finance and you could say yes or no uh, cash deposits from an unknown source yeah i would say that's pretty okay. risky um third party credits so people paying in that we don't know who it is yeah again we do it all the time. We pay our friends, so... Your friends? Yeah. I get, none of my friends give me money. <laughs> You're um, not the organiser within your group. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So so basically then, we've got all these payments from third parties. Uh, what about payments from high-risk jurisdictions? So transfers in. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a big red flag, Yeah. right? Okay. Uh, payments from money service businesses? Again, all of these can be potential red flags. Mm -hmm. I think it's breaking it down further to looking at, okay, how much are we looking at? And okay. and this actually brings on to your point earlier that to commit an you know an act of terrorism or extremism yeah. doesn't cost a lot of money. Yeah. So it's not always looking at the high end yeah. of these transactions, but it's actually looking at the lower end and what they relate to. Okay. So and the reason why there was a re reason why I use those because if I see those, uh, what I um, what I perceive is potential money laundering red flags. I haven't seen anything terrorism related, so let's talk about the, where the money's going. Yes, that's the financing aspect. Um, where does what does the bank account of a terrorist look like when they're sending money out? Again, I think it probably looks very similar to how it's coming in. Mm -hmm. um, the cash but, out, third parties, charities. Yeah, exactly. They might be trying to clean up their act a little bit by making it look a bit more legitimate, yeah. like you said, through charities. But it is, te you know, typically going to these higher risk jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, argue slightly and say they kind of feel more like money laundering typologies. I know this is a bit like difficult, but this is totally cool to be challenged. Um, I'll, I'll see what I think a bank account of a terrorist looks like. I think it looks like a salary, possibly government benefits, maybe pension, maybe some payments from friends and family. They're not as nice as your friends, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's a kind of it. Now, I hope we both get paid our salary. We might be receiving some form of economic benefit. 
So it's starting to look a little bit normal. Now I'm worried about our accounts. Let's think about where it's going. So uh, we'll use ourselves as case studies here. Uh, what's our biggest expense? Mortgage, right? Yeah. Rent. Next, probably gas and electric. Maybe that's these, higher now. Yeah, these days. Maybe that's higher, yeah. Uh, but then... Um, Maybe a car. Car, yeah. yeah. I know you like holidays, so possibly <laughs> holidays. Netflix, gym. Yeah, you've got all these sort of usual transactions. So they kind of look like it. So let's evolve this then. We've got some in famous examples of terrorist incidents. You know, September the 11th was about four to $500,000 to commit. The, the London bombing, we spoke about this earlier, that was about £8,000. Yeah. The source of that money was a loan that was taken by this individual whose profile appeared to make sense. Um, uh, we, we evolve it, the Manchester Evening News attack. Two hundred and fifty pounds, Berlin, and we were talking about Berlin because you were unfortunately there when. Yeah. Which that this is where it starts to become real to me is that when we start to talk about these terrorism incidents and then we had no I had no idea that you were there, but that was a, an attack that cost nothing. So thinking about monitoring then, so we've moved from a point where a terrorist who is designated by sanctions, we've now got extremists that are doing this, and it's becoming even harder for our monitoring tools to detect. But is it? Or is it just that we now need to think about the evolution of what might be financing this? So we spoke about this earlier on, didn't we? We spoke about how uh, the funds can come from legitimate means, yeah, but it's where it's going. Yeah. And it's this evolution, isn't it, from terrorism into extremism. So let's just talk about then where we see some of these payments now going to in this new world. So we spoke about um, certain extremist events music festivals, yeah, food merchandise. So how can transaction monitoring then in the, with the use of technology, how could we look to negate or reduce the risk of these extremist events with that tool? Million dollar yeah. question, right? Yeah, I was about to say, put me on the spot here, James. That's what we do. Bro. And I'm definitely not an expert to, yeah. to give, you know, um, a final opinion on this by any means. But I think that, like you said, it's about recognising maybe these accounts that do look fairly ordinary yeah. and are of what we consider probably low suspicion yeah. and then looking at how they tie into other accounts and how they tie into, you know, are they connected to this charity that mm. is funding this uh, music festival? And it seems that all of the money actually seems to be going into this one account, which yeah. seems pretty suspicious when you look at it like that. Yeah, so we see all this activity coming in, but then it seems to be concentrated into yeah. these areas where monitoring traditionally might not pick it up, but with tech it can. Exactly, because the human isn't necessarily able to see the links. Yeah. Okay, they might be able to see them maybe because there, there's another relation being yeah. paid you know, from that bank account, but can they see within an organization actually where that, where those dots start to all point together. And that's really important because how quickly the tech can do it and how efficient they can do it because there's so much data that has yeah. to be looked at to be able to say, actually, guys, I think this is a bit of a red flag. Yeah. Now, I think this is really good. And, and I want to just evolve the conversation about technology again. Um, so we, we are probably being watched by our fellow AML experts around the world. Um, but maybe people who are looking, aspiring for careers in, in preventing financial crime. I nearly said in financial crime, but that's the, not the wrong <laughs> yeah, let's video. let's not put that out there. Um, but actually, there, there's not, technology now is enabling uh, society to play their role in stopping this. And um, there is a really good app called Stop the Traffic. Now, what the Stop the Traffic is, and it's been associated with typologies around you know, things like cash businesses, like car washers, nail salons, um, where what you can do now with this app, and it's available on the App Store and Google Play, you as a citizen can now report potential human trafficking with the technology. And what it's really clever because what it will do is you can take a picture, say where you were, what you were doing, and it will use recognition tools to be able to help where this information feeds in to do that. Now, that, that's huge. And we also spoke about um, the name uh, perplexes me now. You might be able to remind me of it, uh, where it... It's a piece of software in airports that recognise known animal traffickers, wildlife traffickers. Yeah, it's something monkey. Yeah, the name the name has slipped us. But <laughs> but what the point to the, to talking about this is now? There is technology out there yeah. that is helping us do, um, do this as well. So, just sticking on the theme of transaction monitoring, because I know this is a really important part to you. Um, where do we go from here? That's a big question, right? That is a big question. So, like I said. 
a lot of this stuff is done retrospectively yeah. and, and i think that that is a, a problem in itself is that we need to move more of this into real time yeah and being able to handle more data quickly efficiently and being able to pull in all of these data sources yeah um that humans physically just can't do in the time frame that you're wanting them to yeah. complete it in so where do we go now well, well maybe and sorry to interrupt maybe transaction monitoring the providers that are out are out there uh, maybe they're maybe they are there maybe maybe the technology has been built and actually we're there so maybe the deficiency is another part of the business and 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 i'll tell you what i'm thinking here because uh, because um the, the software providers for transaction monitoring are so intelligent it, it's, it can't be any more real time but it's what we do with that so let's talk about what we do when we identify something unusual or suspicious when our, well a regulated firm what is their obligation if they identify something suspicious they have to file a, a suspicious activity report the report right now uh, let's just add some substance to this in terms of numbers and evidence uh, in europe about a million SARS roughly yeah. get filed we're talking about Europe as a demographic, not the EU. We've got this far without mentioning the B into, word. Yeah. So let's not go <laughs> let's down not. that route. Um, but let's try and drill into these numbers a little bit more. Um, roughly how many SARS do you think are reported in the UK? I would I would hammer a guess at at least 50%. Yeah, and that's because we spoke about it earlier on as well. So you don't get the points that for that one. That was my initial guess. Yeah, okay. It was your initial <laughs> guess. I'll give you that one. Um, but it's about half a million. Second was followed by, from remember, the Netherlands, Netherlands at 300,000. Yeah. So transaction monitoring plays a huge part of that because it's detecting suspicious or potential, uh, potentially suspicious transactions. Now, will those alerts come through. The case lands at my desk. I've got 10 I need to do today. Um, I'm now comparing this transaction. So what am I looking for that will help me determine whether or not this is unusual or in fact it is suspicious? So it just comes through, I've got a payment, it's quite big. What am I going to do with that information? I would say that even if there's a small amount of doubt, mm -hmm. they're gonna file a, a SAR. So they'll look at, let's see then, they're going through a bit of an analysis. What are they comparing it, that, that particular transaction against? They're looking at previous transactions that have been yeah. made. They're looking at all of the points that we've already said about where it's going, the countries and the potential um, other third parties that they're paying and cool. things like that. So I agree. Now they're also comparing it to that customer, right? So we were talking earlier on about CDD and onboarding. Well, part of that onboarding is to understand where's the money coming from? Yeah. What's their source of, well, source of funds? Question here, when did you last update your CDD? Yeah, this one stumped me earlier. I can't remember. I think probably whenever I applied for Monzo, which is a good few years ago, probably. So what it's doing is it's making a decision based on your your previous Outdated profile. Data. And it's making a decision. So it gets to 50-50, and all of a sudden a decision is made to say, well, I can't get the information. There's too many customers we can't call, and they're reporting. So why do we, why do we think that individual is reporting that concern? Fear. Of regulatory fines i mean the the whole aspect of um reputational damage is huge yeah. mm -hmm. you know we've seen some big names be burned at the stakes and nobody wants that yeah um so i think yeah it there is this whole culture of if i don't report it the the um consequence of not reporting and it and it not being anything yeah. is a lot bigger than actually just not reporting it at all. So what that's then doing is all this amazing work and development that's gone into transaction monitoring that will continue to develop through AI machine learning, it's kind of been unpicked a little bit by yeah. vulnerabilities in C D D. Sure. And if you look at and it, I think I had to think then what year it was. That's not a good sign, is it? If you go look at the enforcement fines over the last ten years, common theme is data. Yeah. Takes us back full circle, doesn't it? Okay, I mean we could probably continue talking about this forever. Um, but I think we're pretty much out of time. So Pia, thank you. It's been a pleasure to sit down and talk to you. Maybe we'll do this again on another topic. Yeah, um, it's been a pleasure. And, and thank you everybody for watching as well.